He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The kettle boom drums and the bass thunders and the timbers resonate. Great news is about to be announced. The crescendo rises. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. God spoke to Moses on the fiery mountain and the ground shook. The Lord spoke to Elijah on top of the mountain and the firmaments trembled. Out of Zion, the angel announces the glory. Do not be afraid. I know you seek Christ Jesus, the crucified one. He is not here, for he is risen. Are good. <laughs> Psalm 114, God spoke in the mountains, skip like rams in the hills, and the, the hills like lambs. Early on the third day, the crucified one raises from his tomb, united in body and soul, and preaches unto the captives of hell, not to proclaim unto them a second chance, but the proclamation that Satan is defeated. You cannot expect the father of lies to go around telling about his own defeat. Through the shedding of holy blood, through the shedding of God's blood, death has been emptied of its power. Sin has been forgiven. Satan has been defeated. Christ, who is our mercy seat, Christ, who is our high priest, has paid the price with his very own blood, and sin has been atoned, and triumph over the law has been made. Psalm 57, verse 1, says that this will happen between the cherubim. We take refuge in the shadow of his wings until the storms of destruction have passed by, and they have. Christ, the Lamb of God, is our Passover Lamb. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They went to see the tomb because the tomb was sealed. And while Jesus and his disciples take their rest, the leaders of the people have no rest. And the leaders of the people cannot rest on the God-given Sabbath day because they fear of what Jesus said to be true. And so they seal the tomb. It's interesting that while Jesus rests in a tomb, while the disciples are hiding and resting from what has gone on, the leaders of the people are active. This is a busy day for them on Saturday. They've set the tomb, they've sealed the tomb, they're making sure that Jesus doesn't come back because they're worried about the resurrection. Pilate told them. He says, use your own guards if you want to keep it sealed. They went to Pilate and they're like, we've got to figure out how to keep Jesus from rising from the dead. He said he would rise from the dead. They're like, well, maybe his disciples will come and steal the body. And Pilate's like, go ahead. Make it as, as secure as you think you can. I wonder if there was a smirk might have alighted the guard's face when they spied the women coming up the road to come and look at that tomb. The day of rest had come and gone and nothing had happened. The women approaching the temple guards, which is, by the way, an affront unto Pharisaical tradition. No man spoke to a woman not related by blood or by marriage, at least nobody except for Jesus. Jesus knew their Pharisaical law and he knew that it was made up as an invention of man. And so here we have this clash of cultures. We have a battle of the sexes. Biblical prophecy in the making, who would act first? Who's going to break the silence? The women who aren't allowed to speak to the men because of the invention of the, of the, the rules of men? Or the men who are employed to enforce those rules? And the kettle drums roll. And the mountains skip like rams and the hills like lambs. It's the Lord God Almighty who speaks first. It's the angel that breaks the silence. You see here, God is doing something new. The messenger descends and he rolls back the stone and then he sits on it. I love that word. I'm from the 80s. Sit on it, man. It used to be a big word of derision. It was a simpler and gentle day. Sits on it. This stone... This stone was supposed to be a barrier to the resurrection of Jesus. <laughs> They're going to put a stone in front of it, right? Are you kidding me? This rock is supposed to hold back God? I see your stone, O oh foolish mortals, and I sit upon it. 
I really, I really, I know people ask me every once in a while, they're like, are you watching this new show about the Christ? It's like an HBO thing, I haven't, The Chosen. Are you watching? Like, no, I'm not watching it. But boy, I hope they do this scene. And I want to know what that angel's doing when he sits there. He's got some big old smirk on his face. <laughs> what a wonderful, what a wonderful expression of triumph. The second supposed barrier to Jesus' resurrection, these temple guards. Now these temple guards, by the way, these temple guards are not real soldiers. They're not real soldiers. I know they like to think of themselves as soldiers. Israel is a defeated power. They're not allowed to have any real soldiers. They are a legal religion and part of their religion, part of their religion is the segregation of men and women and the segregation of Jews versus non-Jews. These temple guards, their job is to enforce these rules. And so the angel of the Lord comes down and causes an earthquake and he moves the stone and he sits on it. I can imagine the smirk on his face of just a little bit. And these glorified ushers, not that there's anything wrong with being an usher, <laughs> but these glorified ushers fall as if dead. Because they're as useless as the stupid stone at keeping Jesus in the grave. And yet the people, there are still people that disavow the resurrection. And it's a horrible, sad fact. Some people said it was a fraud. Some people said it was a power grab. It's just a story. Let's face it, guys. If it were just a story, if this were not the way it played out, somebody would have changed it by now. I mean, we have the story. Who is the first ones to see Christ arisen from the grave? Women. <laughs> women, right? At the time, women's testimony wasn't even allowed in court. They weren't even allowed to come into court. If we were perpetrating a fraud, wouldn't we have found better witnesses? Could have paid off a couple of Romans, right? We could have paid off a couple of this or a couple of that. I mean, think about those delightful Ocean's Eleven movies, right? Those are movies about fraud. This is how humanity creates fraud, right? You get a banner-driven cast, Pacino, Clooney, Pitt, Damon. These movies pick out gargantuan proportions. In order to pull off a job like that, you need to assemble a credible witness list, right? Adorned in, in costly attire, they arrive in planes and trains and automobiles and they ooze wealth and credibility and sophistication. The trap is laid and it, it springs upon those who just blithely are looking at all the glitz and the glamour. But what we speak of, what we speak of, this is not attested to by kings. It's not attested to by emperors or good-looking people. I mean, Peter might have been good-looking. I don't know. But he's certainly not a celebrity. He's a dusty old fisherman. What we witness to is not a con job. And Hollywood's not going to fawn over us this day. There won't be a lot of famous people who are going to take up our cause. We have no influencers. There's no high priest, no pharaohs, no kings. And yet this cosmic changing world event will be made known unto everybody because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. Because of the shed blood of Jesus upon Calvary, the sting of death has been taken away. Death has been defeated. Satan is dethroned. The angel proclaims at the empty tomb, He is risen! Christ is alive. And the temple guards testify to the fact. And the women testify to the fact. The myth of the resurrection could have easily been put to the test. It could have easily been put to rest. After all, the Pharisees had within their possession the tomb of Jesus Christ. They could have simply gone to the tomb, unsealed it, and brought the body out. And they didn't. You know why? Because it wasn't there. 
And of course, you think that the two Marys, you could have think that the two Marys basically took that troop of guards out, sort of went Hollywood on them, right? 80 pound women taken on, five glorified. These two women, members of the priesthood of all believers, by virtue of their baptism, Jesus has placed them into their holy office as priests. They are offered a sacrifice of their lives in speaking to a lost and a dying world. Luther says it this way. Even though not everybody has the public office, every Christian has the right and the duty to teach, instruct, to admonish, and to comfort, to rebuke his neighbor with the word of God at every opportunity and whenever necessary. Our vocation is our calling. It's what we do. God has called us to serve our neighbor from the Latin root vocable or vocab, to speak. In a more familiar term, vocation means your place of employment. It's where you go to do whatever it is that you do. But it's more than just your gross employment. It is your place of being in this society. You have a role to fill. And in all of those roles that you fill, that is your vocation. That is what you do. That is where you go to do the thing that you do that makes you you. Our vocation is where God has placed us. To share the gospel with a lost and a dying, depressed world. If I, in my vocation as pastor, walked into the office of, of the state house, or if I sort of snuck my way into Boeing and sat on the line on one of the planes, which would be fun, by the way. I'm pretty sure they're going to arrest me. But if I snuck in there and started preaching Jesus Christ and him's crucified, they would rightly escort me to the door and they'd probably do it rather forcibly. I would be a disruption because I do not belong there. But wherever you go, where you do what you do, you belong. You belong. Wherever Jesus has placed you, dear friend in your respective vocations to serve your neighbor in this earthly life and by your service you have an entree and by your love you have credibility and by your work you have a platform of reliability to speak about your Lord and Savior to tell them about the hope that you have in the resurrection you have the model of forgiveness that you can display upon those who are around you whether it's at the coffee pot or at lunch or at the company picnic there are 10,000 places in this small little town that I cannot go, but you can. And I know you're getting self-conscious about the broaching of the subject of religion. I mean, we've said for 70 years, right, don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion and these things are taboo. Sex is one of those things that used to be taboo too, right? Don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics, don't talk about sex. And now we have flags all over the place. People proclaiming their sexual proclivities. Let me tell you, nothing in our society no longer is off limits. My friends, the king in the universe is the one who sets the ground rules for what looks like a polite, a polite society. Therefore, as priests of God, you are authorized. You are authorized not by the government. You are not authorized by the president. But you have been authorized by Jesus Christ himself to speak about the resurrection of the living and the dead and the coming judgment that will come upon this planet. To share the gospel that you not fear judgment because your sins, which are many and are great, have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. And you can do that without apology. Listen to St. Peter. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his very own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but now, now you are God's people. And once you did not have mercy, but now you have received mercy. No one ever asks permission to share the glorious news of their engagement. Nobody ever asks if they have permission to share the great news of a pregnancy or who your favorite football team is. You ever spoken to somebody who's from the Ohio State University? Right? They don't care. They'll just tell you about it. I'm telling you what, Jesus is more important than football. 
even Arkansas football, if you believe that. <laughs> Unconsciously, we have a way of telling people what we think by what we say and what we choose not to say. You have been bullied into keeping quiet about your faith for some time now. Who here asks permission to tell other people that they've been healed of cancer? It is okay. You have received good news of healing of your mortal soul. Take pride in that. Do not be ashamed of the forgiveness of sins that have been given to you in Christ Jesus. Your sins are forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. That is your identity that has been given to you by virtue of your baptism. And it is increased in you as you feed upon his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins and the strengthening of your faith. Christ's resurrection proves, it proves that death has been overthrown. And in the not too distant future, the mountains will skip like rams and the hills like lambs and the dead will be raised. And you, my friends, will be raised to eternal life with glorified bodies and you will continue to live with Christ into eternity. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will not pass away. These words by Christ to you, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me is baptized will never die. Go in the faith of the Lord. Be fearless and unmovable, for your Christ has already given you eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.